all of the writers and thinkers in this area seem to be saying to us that we're about to undergo quite exponential change. Stuff that human beings have just never seen before because of all of these technologies and changes are starting to merge together. And um, particularly in the area of artificial intelligence and what that's actually going to do to our lives and our work and, and how people will operate in that context. And the thing that's really scary about that is if you look at where the little man is standing, the problem is that when you're standing there, everything feels normal. And that's where we're standing at the moment. Like we might talk about how much things have changed over the last few years, but in reality, the slope has been very gentle and things feel normal and we feel safe and we feel we know our work and our jobs and our business and our future. But, you know, if you look at, um, you know, what is the law of accelerating returns, as in the change is starting to happen fast enough that the graph growing, going vertical is sort of about to happen. That's actually really, really scary when you start to think about what the implications may be. And the problem with that, of course, is that you're inclined to just go into paralysis and do nothing. And the danger is that if in our heads, and of course, that's the only way most of us are able to think, if we look at graphs and growth rates based on the past or what we currently understand to be the rate of change, we will completely miss the rate of change that we're actually looking at, looking coming down the line at us. You know, when, when the devices in our homes are all knowledgeable, you know, when staff have perfect information about all of the jobs that are around and the conditions of work everywhere else, when their phones will be able to give them an app to answer just about any question that they might have even on farm. You know, it raises huge issues about what will that look like and how would we manage people like that. And, you know, coming back to ground a little bit, um, Bill Gates, I think, um, expresses this really well that, you know, we're often um, thinking that things are not happening as fast as they might in the short term, but we completely underestimate how much it's going to change in, in a slightly longer period. So there's a lot of talk, as you can might imagine, in all of the sort of business literature and everything about what's going to happen to, to the world of work. Um, and needless to say, a lot of this is looking at the world of work in big organizations and in global industries. But I think the implications are the same no matter where you sit in, sit in the spectrum. The New Zealand Productivity Commission have done some work where they've come up with four future scenarios. Um, and I keep thinking about these because I keep looking down the track and saying to myself, so with more technology, you know, do we just get different jobs, a lot more jobs, but probably in different spaces. So there'll be loads of stuff that perhaps we won't be doing. I mean, for example, if we get driverless cars, an awful lot of the transport industry will change. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't work for people to do in other places. There may be far more work to do in the care sector, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One of the other scenarios is the tech and artificial intelligence could put huge numbers of people out of work. So that then we're grappling with, you know, huge levels of unemployment and how we're going to pay people who don't work and maybe having to go down the track of universal wages and things like that. And there are other scenarios like stagnation and which doesn't seem likely and steady as she goes, as in things will continue on as much as they are. The consensus of opinion seems to be very much that we're looking at one or two. Now, um, you know, that's only four scenarios. And again, as you can imagine, there's plenty of comment out there to say, well, actually, there have to be a lot more possibilities than that. 
but it's not a bad place to start when you're sort of thinking about what's the effect of technology on people and work. So it's really just a two by two graph. Um, now another, you know, this is that sort of graphed out slightly differently. And, you know, we're right in the middle at the moment as in things are just incrementally changing. But the, the real issue is as you look sort of towards the future in terms of the movement of technology, um, you know, which scenario are we more likely to be moving into? And what are the implications of that for a whole economy? You know, what might that look like in New Zealand? And of course, if you're looking at a sector like dairying, um, you're saying, well, that could be very, very good or it could be very, very bad. I mean, it really depends, I guess, on how things play out. And one of the things I suppose that all of this alerts me to is that if you're interested in this, you want to be on constant watch in terms of which way are the scenarios unfolding. Now, you know, it's a, it's a very simple overview, but it's a very good starting point for thinking. Um, some um, American work has um, started to look at some of this from the point of view of employees rather than from the point of view of employers or the whole economy. And one of the pieces of work that I came across is from the Shift Commission. And they were saying that from an employee's point of view, you could be likely to be looking at less work in the form uh, um, of jobs um, and that if you were going to have any work at all, it would simply be as tasks, contracted out work or gig work or, you know, zero hours contract, that kind of stuff. So again, they were drawing out scenarios there and I would be very mindful of this kind of from an employee's point of view. Um, what is it that an employee can expect, a current employee can expect looking forward? You know, is there going to be more work or less work? Is the work going to come in the form of jobs or is it simply going to come in the form of piecework? You know, because we've got, we've got very high expectations of what comes with a proper job or a good job at the moment. But there seems to me to be growing evidence that loads and loads of people have, you know, very bad jobs. And in fact, I was interested to see that there's a recent book being published, which is really honing in on this. Where have all the good jobs gone? Because I suspect that our employment statistics are not at all reflecting the fact that loads and loads of people have incredibly bad jobs nowadays. It's a very bifurcated economy so that you can be in a good job with a good employer and have very good conditions and high pay and all kinds of protections and privileges. Or you may be somebody who doesn't have enough hours of work or has to run several jobs or is in very poorly paid or precarious sorts of employment. Um, and again, when I think of areas like the dairy sector, um, I'm always thinking at the back of my mind that if I was looking at building a world-class, differentiated, sustainable business, I wouldn't want to be predicating it on offering people a poor job because I think that'll have huge reputational and brand issues and it won't fit with anything else that's actually going to work for that sector. But that's just a, a sort of a personal viewpoint about it. So, you know, I think these, these issues are huge. You know, what's work going to look like? Who's going to be doing it? Um, how are people going to be paid? Um, is work going to be a good place to be or a very bad place to be? And are we going to have, you know, a very, very divided economy where that's very good for some people and it's very bad for others? One of the other kind of big things that's all over the literature everywhere for the last um, 
couple of decades almost is um, the difference that the different generations coming into the workplace um, are, are bringing. Now, the, the millennials are the group that there is the most talk about. And these people are quite different, I think, than, than so many of us. Um, many of them are very highly educated. That's certainly, um, you know, very, very obvious on this side of the world. Um, it seems to me that, you know, young people are getting a very strong message that unless they're getting a very good education, their future is very bleak. But they're very purposeful in what they're seeking from work. Um, and they're quite demanding of their employers. I, I know I'm seeing quite a subset of young people as yet here, but I've got 15 nieces and nephews living very closely to me here. And it's very interesting listening to them talking about where they're working and what the expectations are and what their prospects are and what things they like and what things they don't like. And issues like the way that they're managed and the amount of development they're getting and the flexibility or otherwise that goes with their work seem to be enormously important. Now, again, when I project anything like that into the dairy sector for the future, I say to myself, well, I would be wanting to have educated and intelligent employees. I can't see how you're going to run a world-class business without them. And if I'm going to want to attract a better type of employee, what are the implications then for what they want and what it's going to take to attract and keep them. Because unless the work we're going to offer is going to be incredibly mundane, um, then we're going to need some of these better people to do it. And I suspect that the more technology takes hold, the better the employee, the brighter and better educated and more willing to learn the employee is going to need to be. So, I think there are huge implications in that whole literature for, for, the, for the whole sector. Um, the other thing that's huge um, is the whole issue of diversity. Um, I've been amazed even at the small amount of time I've been overseas, how much um, emphasis there is in the media about diversity and inclusion. Um, and the, the aspect of that, I guess, that I've seen in the dairy sector in New Zealand has mostly been around the issue of migrant workers. But I suspect that there is a much bigger issue behind this and that it's a yet another, it's yet another whole area that the sector is actually going to have to pay a lot of attention to and grapple with you know, as, as we go forward. If there's a much wider range of people coming to work in our industry, what does that actually mean? How will they be made welcome? How will we lead them? How will we integrate them? How will we make those kinds of teams work? Uh, and, and all the signs are there that it's going to be different in the future rather than, rather than the same. And not just because young New Zealanders might choose not to make themselves available in the dairy sector. I think there's a much, much bigger issue than that here. Um, one of the other things I think that's really at the, at, the, um, at the heart of all of this is that all these changes um, are merging together in a lot of ways that's actually making what's happening in business and in the workplace much more innovative. We've got several different generations in the workplace now everywhere. Um, you know, we're talking about a hundred year life cycle for our generation, which means that an awful lot of us are going to be around for a long time as our, our parents' generation. And um, there are an awful lot of different cultures involved. There are an awful lot of different skill sets required to run the successful enterprise now. And actually getting all of this stuff to cross pollinate in a way that takes innovation in the direction we want seems to be something that's coming up over and over again in the literature. You don't 
seem to be able to get the innovation you need unless you can make the group of people interact and collaborate and work in, in, in a way that's really positive. what are the implications kind of for the employer or the leader or the manager and you know one of one of the things that's kind of um in my mind is kind of if the world is trending in this direction um how do how do i as a business owner or as a leader or manager how do i get to the future faster because i can i can argue against this and i can come up with all kinds of reasons why i don't want to do it or i shouldn't do it but i'd like to be at the forefront of whatever's going to happen rather than be dragged sort of into into whatever the future looks like so i guess if i'm owning a business or running a business or i'm trying to attract and keep good employees i want to be in some position where I'm looking like some kind of business or industry or employer of choice. And, and I guess when I look at this kind of strategically, on the one hand, I'm kind of talking way out, if you like, 10 or 20 years ahead. But I think the, the real issue then strategically for any business owner is to do that and at the same time say, and what are the implications for what I do over the next year or two? because it's really easy to kind of put on your visionary or dreamer's hat um, or catastrophe hat, as the case may be. But the, but the real issue is kind of what can I do sort of um, at a much more immediate level. And um, Pierre Wack, who was the um, original guy behind scenario planning, um, you know, he, he was always saying, you know, somebody's out at the front of this seeing the future coming you know can you look in your own sector or your own business and say what's it likely to be like and am i starting to kind of move in in, in that direction and i think if you're taking those two long-term and short-term sort of perspectives you're sort of asking these kinds of questions and say you know what what kind of industry or business are we likely to be in 10 or 20 years from now? And the answer is you don't know. But what are some of the small initiatives that you can kind of take on board at this stage and say, how could I experiment with some changes or moving in the direction of, for example, more involved employees, more learning going on in my business, um, better interactions between the people I have, um, changing my model of how I manage or lead so that I'm more attractive, for example, to the type of millennial that I was talking about earlier, like relatively small things, not big things because um, every, everybody's got a business to run, everybody's got a day job. So I suppose they're the questions I have, you know, and if I was bringing that down, you know, I'd be bringing it down to what are the sort of initiatives that I can take on sort of in 100 days, you know? Um, how would I put a number around the issue as in what would I actually be trying to do? Like, would it be, would it be something like, um, given that um, this group of people tend to be incredibly focused on learning and development, would it be that once a quarter I'm going to have a discussion with them about their progress and their learning? You know, can I set some milestones about something doable that allows me to move forward? Um, and, you know, one of the other things I'd be asking myself, which in some ways is the direct opposite of what I've been talking about, is saying, you know, what's not going to change? And, you know, it, it, it's, it's actually a really good question because I think the answer to it when we're talking about employment and work is that human nature doesn't change that much. So what is it that kind of people want and care about? And, you know, if you go back to old models, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, he tells us things like that, you know, until we satisfy people's physiological needs, as in, you know, they're warm and they're housed and they've got enough sleep, 
Then the, until they have that, they don't care about things like security of employment or anything else. And until they have that, they don't care about, you know, inclusion and being part of a team and so on. And, and they keep moving up the scale. Or as, you know, Stephen Covey put it, people want to live, love, learn, and feel that their life has some meaning and purpose. Now, I don't think those aspects of human beings are going to change. But I actually think, you know, it's easy to start to do something about some of those things right now. And that those things move us in the direction of where, you know, it certainly looks like the mass of people are starting to demand much more, or at least the kind of people you would want to employ. So there's a real issue around saying, how do I make the things like the employee experience better? How do I make being in this industry a wonderful experience? Because certainly as an employer, I would want to be, I would want to have choice about I who I could attract, not actually having to settle for the kinds of employees that most other industries would reject. That would be a kind of a key thing for me. So the kind of change thing then that I think, you know, becomes really important at the management or leadership level is, you know, can I move myself into a growth mindset? Now, you know, we're great in, in the agri sector in New Zealand at kind of having a growth mindset when it comes to things like productivity and profit and so on. But we haven't been nearly so good when when we're thinking about what does that actually mean about people, you know, because we've got quite fixed mindsets about how, what the work is, how the work has to be done, who does the work, how we manage the workers, what the conditions are and so on. And I think the, the only difference between having a fixed and a growth mindset is the willingness to say, um, I don't know, but I'm sure I can tackle the problem. Um, and we're not there yet, but we're moving in that direction where a fixed mindset takes up a position where it just argues for what we've currently got. So I think that that would be a huge one would be to say, you know, where, where are we kind of stuck? And, you know, in a very practical level, you know, that comes down to just the kind of things that people say. You know, it's so easy to say no, and yet when you say yes and, everything changes, you know. Or one I hear our favourite Francie saying, you know, instead of saying that's not how we do things around here, you know, she's picked up the habit of starting lots of sentences with saying things like, how might we? You know, which is an opener rather than a closer. And so th there are very small things, I think, you know, that don't mean you've got to change anything major tomorrow or next week that actually start to let us say, how can we look at some of this differently? Um, because the work, work and the workplace is changing. Now, you know, to, to be a bit of a rebel in this area and do something different than everybody else in the sector is doing, that actually requires a little bit of vulnerability because the starting point is kind of, maybe I don't know the right answer and maybe we haven't got it right, um, but I'm actually willing to try something new. Um, and that, you know, that's actually really hard to do, but it's a, it's a, it's an absolute requirement for making some change. Uh, because I think one of the things we can certainly say is that we can, if we continue to do what we currently do, the future doesn't look good on a lot of fronts in terms of, of work and employment. Um, and you know, graft, this stuff looks a bit like this, you know, instead of looking for silver bullets or big answers, you're looking for sort of small little movements, you know, little experiments with the customer who in this case would be the employee, if I'm, if I'm wearing that hat, you know, where we try things out with the team, 
uh, with the individual employees and say, you know, what's working, what isn't. But we're moving in the direction of something that's taking us somewhere better than we are. But, um, I think the bit that's actually going to blow us away is the way that the stuff is going to converge. You know, um, I, I'm not sure if the participants have seen the webinar um, um, that, that we had a couple of weeks ago, but one of the things that stood out from some of the things that Melissa said to me was, you know, the convergence between things like your um, your home sort of being wired up to the, your fridge talking to the supermarket and the supermarket already preordaining where the food came from and everybody being able to understand and demand sort of exactly what they wanted and where they got it from and how quality it was and everything else. And when you start to look at that sort of stream of information, I think that has huge implications for what we do and how we do it. I mean, there's huge, um, there's huge transparency in it for a start. You know, um, it'll be awfully hard to hide. It'll be awfully hard to pretend that you're doing something well, that you're not doing well. I think people are going to be asking questions about all sorts of aspects of, um, you know, the businesses we run and how we do things. Um, and we've, we've gotten away, I guess, in all sectors, you know, until relatively recently, as long as we produced a decent product or a decent service, nobody could really take the lid off and say, so what's going on behind that? And do I like that? Or is it good enough? Or is it ethical? Or is it sustainable? And, and I think that's changing very, very rapidly. And you know, I, I guess at a personal level, it's making me think about everything I do and how I do it and saying, if people knew all of that, would they still like that? And, you know, I'm only, I'm only um, um, a self-employed person, but if I had a brand or I had a business, I think I'd be really asking questions about that because... I think all of that is going to be on the table very quickly around everything that we do. Um, and I think we're seeing in a lot of what's going on in the media that there are very harsh judgments being made about people and organizations who are not as they present themselves to be. So it's those kinds of things, I think, that have, you know, just enormous ramifications in every area of life. Um, one of the things, I suppose, that echoes this and where some of my thinking is coming from is, you know, there, there's starting to be a lot of noise around a much more people-first economy. I mean, we know how to do productivity. We know how to do profit. We know how to do performance on a lot of fronts. The other P's that are really starting to come up, um, I guess internationally, are you know people talking about purpose, people talking about uh, building businesses and economies that put people at the center rather than shareholders' interests. Uh, talking about the planet, you know, this is where all the stuff about sustainability and everything else comes in. And a group no less than the Business Roundtable in August um, had put out a new document sort of about the purpose of business. And I've only lifted one quote out of it, where they're talking about their purpose as promoting an economy that serves all Americans. Now, that's quite unprecedented. You know, we haven't seen anything like that, you know, sort of um, almost, um, you know, in a century. Uh, and I guess all I'm picking up on is that there's, a, there's an underlying international trend, I guess, of people starting to talk more and care more about things like purpose and people and the planet. 
And I just keep asking myself then, what are the implications of that for a sector like agriculture and in particular dairying? And in particular in New Zealand, if that's the way, you know, the leading thinkers in the world are starting to drift, what's that going to mean for our sector and our businesses in say 20 or 30 years time? It won't happen quickly, but it's going to drive an awful lot of the choices that people make. Um, and, and I can't see any sign that that could be overturned. And I guess, again, if I, you know, if I look back to the transparency issue, you know, you're going to see people looking for evidence of this kind of stuff. They're going to be asking questions about what we're doing in those kinds of spaces. So it sort of, it, it means that the management models are moving and, you know, that's just um, a picture that I found that was really, um, you know, clarifying what the changes had been, if you like, over the last century or two, you know, where we went from a very industrial sort of model to one now where, you know, we're, we're moving into a field where we're, we're managing people who are educated and networked and informed and who you know, not only don't require people to stand over them, tell them what to do minute by minute, but who won't even tolerate it in, in, in many sectors. And what, of course, that really means then is that that requires a new type of manager. Now, Gary Hamill, who's one of the leading management writers, he's at the um, London School of Economics, I think, he coined the concept of management to zero a few years ago, you know, and he was basically saying, if the world is changing like this and work is changing like this, then what does that mean for the people who lead and manage people or the people who own businesses? And, and of course, it means that well beyond just being financially remunerated, people expect all kinds of other satisfactions um, in the workplace and they expect completely different behaviours from the people who lead and manage them. Now, that'll take quite a while to trickle down to the SME level and I totally get that, um, but it's certainly a direction I would want to be moving in because sooner or later it really starts to bite in terms of whom I can attract and how they will expect to be led or managed. And I, you know, unless the world of work moves in the direction of, you know, people having, you know, horrible jobs um, and only doing the bits that um, technology um, can't do, I suspect that, you know, we're going to need smarter and better um, people on farm as we go forward, because a lot of the drudge work will be done by technology. One of the other things that I was going to signal that I think is a huge underrated trend is that um, we're going to see an awful lot more work done remotely. Now, I can imagine dairy farmers listening to this and saying, well, you know, welcome to my world. Who's going to bring in the cows and who's going to milk them and so on. But there's going to be loads and loads of work in every sector that does not actually require a person to be physically present because of the technology we have and because of what we can do remotely. And I think the, you know, this is one of those things that's, um, it's a small number now and it's easy to ignore and people say oh well how do you manage people that you can't see and will they be doing any work etc cetera, etc cetera. but one of the things i'm keeping an eye on is that while that's a relatively small percentage of the workforce it's a steady and growing trend and I think, again, it, you know, it's a very interesting trend when you think about it in terms of where farms are physically and what work in the future you might want done 
that might not have to be done by somebody who's there? And what are the implications of that? And how would you organize that and arrange it? So that graph is something that I will be keeping an eye on because to me, that's one of those sleepers in the background that's going to really take off. Um, and when I look at the concern that is over here, that I think is much greater in Europe than anything that I have felt in Australasia, like the concern here about climate change, and the concern about pollutants and concern about travel and cars and um, and so on. Um, there are an awful lot of things that are going to be driving um, a push in this direction. But it has huge upsides for an industry like dairy farming in a place like New Zealand. Um, so it's one of the things that I would be watching and thinking about it. The, the other thing I'd be putting a huge amount of thought and effort into is um, how we help people learn and grow. And again, we tend to come at this sort of from a deficit point of view where we get very concerned and upset because people aren't as good at something as we need them to be. And that's a very real issue and I'm not denigrating, but there's another side to this, which is the huge requirement and expectation people have now for continual learning and being given the skills that keep equipping them to kind of survive in their world. And again, when it's only when you go and look at the graphs that this moves out of the touchy-feely, nice-to-do kind of stuff. But the, um, all of the feedback that's coming back from employees is that stuff like training and development and flexibility and everything is way up at the top of what they're looking for from work. And some of the things that we think that they care about are actually much, much lower down the, the tray. Um, so I know that if I were running a business, I would be wanting to position myself as somewhere that people felt if they spend any time in my business or under my leadership, that they were going to learn a lot and that they were going to go out much better and stronger than when they came in. Because I don't think I'd be able to attract anybody that was any good if I didn't do that. Um, and again, I think it's an area that's really undercooked and that we could do a huge amount more in very easily without spending an enormous amount of money. But I think it, would, it, it not only would have a huge effect on our current businesses, but I think it positions you where the trend is very clearly moving. You know, and again, I'm watching young people here join new businesses and so on and complain within a couple of months that they're not learning enough, they're not being given enough to do, they're not being challenged enough and already kind of thinking about looking for something else because they're so concerned that they're sort of used, losing a year of learning that they should be having. Um, and I don't see that anything is going to arrest that trend. So I'm going to conclude because I could rabbit on on this stuff all night. I'm going to conclude with Yogi Berra again, who said, I think very, very insightfully that you can observe a lot by watching. And I guess what I've tried to do in the last hour is really outline for you the sorts of things I'm seeing, but the trends I'm going to be really watching and monitoring. And no matter what industry or business kind of I'm working in, they're the things that I'm going to be highlighting for people and saying, you know, what are the implications of this for your sector or your particular business? And how do you make sure that you're not at the wrong end of this if the future unfolds the way it looks like it's going to?